Welcome to Worship Tutorials Live with Brian and Bradford. I asked Brad to, to, uh, to uh, play me a little background bumper music. Never a disappointment. Hmm. Say uh, hey! I was, I hope love I, to know where you're from. What'd you say? I wish I had that more on lock. Oh, I was trying to play try Beauty and the Beast, but... Yeah, try, I heard it trying again. I like that. Bum, bum, ba, dum, ba, ba, da, da, da. Alex G, hello. So today, there it is. Hey Johnny, what's up? Uh, Johnny Q is with us in the in the chat room. Hey, I asked Johnny. him the other day. I said, uh, I said, Johnny, are you? Because Johnny has a. I hope I hope he's okay with me sharing this personal piece of information. Has a uh, has a baby at home. And I was like, Johnny, are you getting any sleep? And he laughed at me. And I said, No, it's it's cool. You you in, in about a year you can go to sleep. <laughs> so. Um, we have a question from Alex G. Speaking of gear, this is a great segue. Oh man, listen to that. This guitar is just like, it's, it's perfection. It's been sitting, uh, it for needs... about a week since Brian and I were at NAMM. He hasn't touched it and it's still in, tune. still in tune. It needs new strings, which we can remedy today. Which you almost don't really notice that it needs new strings. Because yeah. Nick Fearson with bad <laughs> strings sounds like most guitars with good strings. <laughs> All Which right. could be an excellent segue to us talking about many things, actually. Yeah, so Bradford and I were in Nashville uh, at NAM, Summer NAM, the city know what, that never sleeps. Do we know what NAM stands for? North American Music Mer Merchants, something like that. It has to do with merchants so, or something. If like you're that. not familiar with NAM, it's a trade show for all things guitar, not just guitar, but music gear related. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Met a lot of good people. Um, so we thought today we would talk about, in light of a lot of things that have happened in the gear world recently, it's like modeling, it's kind of funny, Brad and I were talking about this this morning, modeling is sort of having a, a there's like a new wave happening with modeling right now, but nobody's actually putting anything new out into the market it, as, far as, like, as far as like the modeling tech. But there are new products. So there's the Kemper Stage. And when I say nothing new is coming to the market, the Kemper Stage uses the same technology as the Kemper Toaster. That's seven years old at this point, which is crazy. There's the Fractal FM3 is coming soon, which is sort of their response to the uh, Line 6 HX Stomp, I guess you could say. The, um, what else is new? Oh, Helix uh, Firmware 2.80. And Brad and I will talk about that in a bit. We're pretty convinced that they didn't just add new stuff. I think they just made everything sound better. They did adjust some coding or something. Something yeah. very general. But I'm like, come on now. That Whatever you did makes... It's, it, it, does not, it does not sound like the same Helix that I had a week ago. Very and nice. I don't believe it's placebo. Okay, so Alex G asked me this. Brian, what gear were you using for the great things leave on the last vlog? So I posted a Sunday vlog. This is iced coffee, by On Wednesday. A little Stoke in the Worship Tutorials mug, which is available at worshiptutorials.spreadshirt.com. I need to put, like, links to the merch that we have. And we need to get some legit, like, new t-shirts made up. That's what we need. Uh, like the long line tee that I... Aww. So lovingly referred to as a blouse for men. But uh, anyway, so uh, so yeah, so I, I uploaded the Sunday vlog and uh, just a little clip from worship. Uh, we opened with great things and uh, I threw in like the lead part in there that I played. I can do these things because I edit the vlogs. So put whatever I want in there. Uh, so it did sound particularly good. And uh, half of that I can contribute to myself. The other half I contribute to... Uh, 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 Jody, who runs oh. runs the live mix. But it was the Axe Effects, right? Right. So I use the I use that PRS guitar. Gear rundown over. <laughs> that PRS guitar with Lambertone. It was on the bridge pickup. That's a Lambertone's uh, grinder in the bridge. Crema on the neck. That thing is PRS Custom Twenty Four. It is awesome. It does have uh, aftermarket pickups. And it I ran through the um, 
aftermarket sounds dirty when you're talking about Curtis's stuff. Speaking of premium, premium pickups in it. I ran that through the Axe FX3, and uh, on that patch, I think I used probably the Morgan AC20 amp model. That's pretty much my go-to for Axe FX. Yeah. So let us know your questions. Um, we got a few in the comments. We didn't go by Breedlove. I'm sure they have good stuff, but Brian and I. I just, gotta tell you, nothing about Breedlove is just something that we've. I have. I there's two things about Breedlove. The first one is the Breedlove users are some of the most passionate people about promoting the brand, which I think is great. Because anytime you post anything about acoustic guitar, at least on worship tutorials, there inevitably are just all these comments: "Breed love, breed love, breed love." Um, second thing is, I have played. We just have never really. Played I've them. played several. No, I have. I, well, well, when was the last time you played one? Well, it's, it's been. That's what I mean. I played John's. That's what I mean. Um, John's this is Bergen, nice. Yeah, John's Bergen is nice. Yeah. They were uh, super hip when I was at Liberty. Yeah. The worship leaders because of Shane and Shane. I have played a handful of breed loves, uh, and I've never connected to one of them yeah. so um yeah here was another question uh about nam national association of music merchants thank I knew you mark. something like that yeah did martin have anything cool at their at nam uh they brought a bunch of acoustic guitars <laughs> and uh i played one of the martins that i've always wanted to play and they have they have a line called the authentic series and what they do is they torify the top, so they simulate. It's pretty cool. They simulate what seventy years of aging would do to the wood, which basically. But it's not like relict. Well, this one was. It was okay. But torification and relicking are different. So torification is like aging the wood. Basically, they bake it, um, and it it hardens all the resins in the wood. It makes it a lot more alive sounding, if you will. Um, so it's like what you do with a maple neck to make it roast ma roasted maple. Yeah, I think it's similar. I'm not sure if it is or Speaking not. Speaking of roasted maple. Look at that. There's roasted maple back there. Anyways. It looks like looks nice and coffee-ish color with mm. with, with cream in it. That's not course. coffee anymore. That is, <laughs> that is now a dessert beverage. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so the, I played one of those, and they had a Martin D28, and they so they had the top was torrified. So it was supposed to sound like 60, 70 year old wood. And it was aged. It was like a relic. It was, but looked like a, it was a 1939 authentic. It was $10,000. I played it. It was okay. I will say, <laughs> we then went, this is not, was this is not order be, of events. I was expecting to be blown away. but I'll Yeah. Say, yeah. But this is not order of events, but we did go to Carter's later. We went to Carter Vintage. We'll talk about this. And played some... Like aged guitars. We played a legit 1940s. Like lots of them. D28. Like five to twenty some odd thousand dollars. It was insane, and it was very reminiscent. I like. I mean, there was a couple days in between, and like we were on the NAM floor, which is yeah. always loud. It's but not a good listening it environment. It was. It had that like mid-range like character warmth, mm -hmm. like old school sound thing it was it was cool the authentic the like the thing that was made this yeah. year but the sound like it was made in the 40s or whatever yeah it was kind of interesting to play very cool to play like martin's aged version of mm -hmm. that guitar and, like, and the then legit one. we went to carter's and there was a 1942 or something it was it's the one in the vlog right or was yeah. that a Gibson? That was, was that a Gibson Martin? in the vlog. Okay. We didn't put the Martin in the vlog. But it was like a 1940s. Probably because I did the footage and it was out of focus. <laughs> no, it was like, you had footage of me, but it was just grabbing it. Yeah. It wasn't playing. Oh, it. yeah. I was trying to uh, take a picture and I hit the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was like a 1940-something Martin D28. It was like the legit guitar. And uh, yeah, I mean, it sounded really good. Um, but I think we both came away from that thinking like, Vintage guitars are not for us. Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't just. I wasn't moved by one. We also kind of came to the conclusion that like, if you want a vintage guitar, chances are this isn't hard and fast. But chances are like, you know, you want that vintage guitar right. for a certain reason. Right. And so you don't you don't go like to Carter's. Which one am I going to buy today? Like. You go to Carter's because you know there's they have one of the ones that you want and you want to get it. It's yeah. it, it's like a different approach. Yeah, but, and I think too it's like with a vintage instrument. It's oh, there's like, Curtis. Hey, Curtis. It's like you need to play it and it needs to like 
I, I, I wouldn't buy one online, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, that one thing I learned from that trip was never, ever buy a vintage guitar without playing it. Yeah. Because... It, I, we unless, up, unless it's merely for collecting. So here's a here's a yeah here's a crazy thing. There was a 1955 blonde Fender Telecaster. Yeah, and right next to it was a 1950. It was 52 or four and 59, I think. Oh, 59 and 55. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. That's right. And uh, the 55 legit to me legitimately felt like a Fender made in Mexico Telecaster. Like that's how it felt. And obviously it's got way more mojo than that, but I thought to my, like, my MJT Telecaster right here feels different, but I like it better. <laughs> so, yeah. we could use that to segue. Okay. Because somebody asked, and to be honest, I do not like these questions, because there is no best. Yeah. There is literally never, ever in the history of the world will there ever there be a no best, best. Yeah. Because no one in the whole world will ever all completely agree on what the best is. I will always choose to my dying day to say you need to pick a guitar that is in your price range yeah. that you think looks great and inspires the junk out of you to play guitar night and day nonstop. Yeah. Staying up till 2 a.m. when you got to wake up at 6 for work. That's what I'm always going to say. Yes. However, okay. the new Fender Ventera oh, line. Man. They killed it. Everything that we picked up Felt like it should have cost way more than the eight hundred to twelve hundred dollar range yeah. that they are gonna be in. They killed it. So yeah. we didn't put any of we didn't put any of this in the, that vlog you made, right? No, but I'm making. There's a separate there's a, video. We're doing coming. a separate one. So yeah. Brian's gonna do a separate video on. You keep talking. Fender. This is bothering me. The What's framing. That? Look how much. Look how much space is to to my. To, to this side of you me. You want me to scoot over? No, no. I'm gonna move okay. the camera. All right. You I keep can talking. Do, you can do that too. I'm gonna adjust. Some All right. Here. So, we spent some time with some uh, the people at Fender, um, and uh, first off, we think that we could have some great content coming oh, yeah. sometime soon. It's happening. But their Ventera line, Vintage well, that's, Era. That's way better. That is better. <laughs> it stands for Vintage Era. Yeah. They basically took a decade, not like, they, and they f took like the best things from each model of that guitar mm -hmm. from that particular decade, and put those... Attributes. It's, it's really cool how they touched it. Yeah. So like a Ventera Tele is gonna co probably cost you like eight, eight, or, eight, eight or nine hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, new. That's new, and you know. But I picked those things up, and I was very impressed. They feel really good. Very impressed. Um, the Made in Mexico line I thought was kind of going downhill lately, and like I, I this is not a world I'm in, so I really don't know. But the reason I say that is because like the prices were going up. But, like, I was playing things, and, like, it just didn't seem to be much to it. But they they looked... The biggest thing for me, I think, is that they changed their fret work. They, the frets on yeah. all the guitars looked way different, which is yeah. most of the time what you're going to say makes... If you're going to say a guitar doesn't feel good, it's largely going to be based on, like, the fact that they got, like, yeah. flat, and not setup. really good yeah. frets. So they have tellies. They have a telly with a Bigsby, which apparently is the first one they've ever done like model that it's the first um production run telly that they've done with the bigsby is it i think I they said that too, yeah. like you can get a custom shop one but like it's not right. it wasn't an offering until now it's the praise and worship guitar pra the praise and worship guitar. <laughs> it looks really good it's too. a combination of everything it's, you, you want. know what i you know what else i love about it i don't it like was, bigsby's on telly it was personally. sunburst but it had a mint fit guard mint green that's guard. right that's right and i am into that yeah, yeah. With and, Bigsby, of course, yeah. So they had those, they had strats, they had Jaguars, they had Jazzmasters, they had basses. Um, yeah. It was killer. Yep. I want one of something. I don't know what. I think I think there may be a chance for us to maybe put some, make, put some in some content in the future. We, yeah. met, some, we met some people. At we Fingers, met some so great people. Cool. Um, they were awesome. Yeah, and they, they also upgraded the pickups on them. So we, that's had, right. we didn't get that's to play right. them. That's right. We didn't play them through the we end, but they did but upgrade just, pickups, and yeah. so I mean the Tim Shaw, right? Yeah, Tim Shaw designed stuff. Yes. Um, so that that's a good thing. Uh, but okay, he's a, for those of you, he's a custom shop guy, right? I think so. Or he was like a, at least for pickups. I'm or not something. exactly sure. He's famous for pickup design. I don't Basically, know. it's a good thing, regardless. Yeah. Okay, so there have been a, a lot of questions and discussion in the comments already about Kemper. Kemper Stage. Mm. 
uh, and particularly about um, now, uh, we're, Bradford and I would like to to make a caveat here. Uh, if you ask us which one is best, we're not going to entertain that question. Because that question doesn't have an answer. It doesn't. Because it's extremely personal. Um, and what I have found, in it, having owned all of this stuff, I don't own a Kemper stage, but I own a Kemper. And Brad and I play through, and the, the Kemper stage and the Kemper uh, head or rack, is it's exactly, the, they didn't change the sound at all. It's just a new form factor. Yeah. And so Brad and I constantly play Helix, Axe FX3, AX8, and Kemper. Yeah. Soon to be Boss GT1000. Ooh, That's happening. We're going to make that announcement. That. We've got one on the way. Yes. It's coming. It's, it's actually coming. shipping today. Yes. Yes. So we're going to make some content with the Boss GT1000. Um, Maybe. So uh, uh, if you would like us to make content with that, uh, I will send you my Venmo. And you can... Yeah. <laughs> so we play these things all eat. the time not only here in this setting but like live we we have used every single one of those pieces of hardware live i can tell you from and this is my own experience but hands down the difference in tone it used to actually it, it, i used to think it was bigger like as far as difference in tone it is so minute these days the difference in tone that if you know what you're doing with it, you can take any one of those products and make them sound world class. Yeah. And nobody's going to tell the difference. Like if you sit down there and ABCD with them, you can they they sound a little different. But I I don't think one sounds better than the other. Yeah. And and it, it, especially it, the amount of time you new, put into it will equate yeah. to how good it's going to sound. Especially after this new. Um, firmware update from line six with the new stuff they've added like they raised it up it legit sounds better but they also added you know the king of tone and they added the fullerton amp model which is a 1950s fender deluxe and it is probably at least top two favorite amp models in the helix for me right now it is hands down the best fender amp model i think i played at least it for praise and worship stuff i played it for five minutes <laughs> this morning and i was just this morning. Yeah. Very impressed. So, um... Like, we love our Deluxe so, Reverb patch we put out a couple months ago, but... Yeah, this is better. This is better. Yeah. Um, so, the question was from somebody earlier in the comments, and if you've been talking to us, I'm sorry, we were kind of going on. Brad and I have, like, many long rants that we'd like to go down today before Always. we go to lunch. Always. Um, so, we're going to go there, because uh, I think this is important to know. I think this is important for... For you, to, for people to hear, and I think it's going to actually like free people if they get this stuff we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because I and I do this with camera all the time. I'm constantly switching camera systems, and it's like the the end result is pretty much the same, regardless of. To most with. people who are watching, they'll yeah. never notice that Brian went with a four thousand dollar camera versus a one thousand dollar. <laughs> to most people, the the running joke is. Um, Brian or myself will will take a picture and um, the, <laughs> yes. uh, whoever whoever it took the picture the other one says that my my like if I use my iPhone Brian's like well my Black Magic camera can do that too or Brian takes a picture I'm like well I can do the same thing on my iPhone it's just kind of funny but yeah <laughs> it is funny it's an inside joke Brad is like particularly skilled with the iPhone camera he makes he takes some good stuff I personally take my you know. I'm a millennial, Brian. Big, huge piece of camera kit, and I can get about the same results. <laughs> Brian knows how he's getting what he's getting, though. I just yeah, I don't need to use the fake depth of field software hack hey. that the iPhone does. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, uh, so Somebody I'm trying to find out Lincoln who the Rooster Strat real quick. Oh yeah, you want to talk about it? It was in a shadow box, and we didn't get to play it. We didn't get to play it. Yeah, that's all. I we took got. a picture of it. Yeah, with my non iPhone camera. I took um, a picture with my iPhone. I posted it on our stories, and it looked great. Yeah, he took a picture, and immediately it was on the internet. And mine was like, is still sitting on my computer, waiting to get edited. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Who was it that asked the question? Um, Benjamin Evans. Oh yeah, I'm weighing the option of selling my HX Stomp and my pedals for a Kemper stage. What are your thoughts? Is it worth it? Here's the question that you have to ask yourself. I will say this. Is it worth it to you? The end result, the tone that, come, that comes out of the speakers on Sunday morning will not be better 
with well, it might be depending on how well you. If you're use inspired, your it'll probably be better. It dead serious. I I can tell you that if that I'll I'll use Bradford for example. Bradford could take your HX stomp and pedal rig, or the Kemper stage, and get equally awesome results out of either one of them. And I say that because Brad just knows what the heck he's doing with pedals and gear and stuff, and he gets great tone. Can so I the, interject real quick? Yeah. The well, it reason, depends on what your pedals are. But. The reason why that that statement can be true is not because of anything other than the fact that I've spent time. Yes. So, spend time. Continue. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but, so, the, is the, the question you might be asking yourself is the amp modeling better in Helix or Kemper? Stock, it's probably Kemper is better. If you use great... IR cabs, and you really know what you're doing, especially with the new amp models that they, they've done and stuff. Or if you buy one of our presets think, and let us do the work for you. Yeah. Me. I think that you would be extremely hard-pressed to tell the difference, and Kemper users around the world are now wanting to throw everything at me. But I, I'm, it, I don't think it sounds that much better anymore. It, I think it used to. Which is, should be a good thing. Yeah. Which I think you should... Like, it, it's a good thing. The thing about buying, like, a stomp rig and adding pedals and stuff like that is, like, you could spend a little bit of money at a time. Yeah. And and slowly build up a rig, and then... And you, if you love pedals, you get to use your pedals. Yeah, and, yeah. like, there are just some things that, like, the stomp you're going to be limited by because you can only have six blocks, and there's lots of things. Mm -hmm. The stage is, like, it's mega cool. I'm going to be figuring out how to get one just because, like, yeah. I, I don't always use the remote with the Kemper Live. Um, just because, I mean, I don't know, just because mm -hmm. I always change stuff. I like to change things. And so You're honestly, a pedal board guy. yeah, I'm a mm -hmm. pedal board guy. That's what I like. And that's do. what, but you made this comment earlier, play what inspires you. Yeah. That inspires you. Yeah, it does. Which is like, yeah, like it, it being able to tweak knobs and have film and stuff. is like, that's fun for me. Mm -hmm. Like just yesterday before rehearsal, I took out. I had a the Jackson Broken Arrow and this way huge conspiracy theory, which is a clone. Oh, nice! It's awesome, by the way. Like it's like a sleeper. Like they like slipped that release under the radar. Like I, I haven't seen anybody talking about it. Um, I bought one. It's freaking shick. Um, anyways, I pulled those two off. I thought you were gonna say something else. I was like, <laughs> that, Brad, what are you talking? I think I was trying to say so, sweet, but I, I decided to say sit. I pretty much I almost had a Brian Wall Happy Day moment there. <laughs> Um, Keep it clean. But I pulled those two pedals off and I threw the Benson preamp and an old school custom shop full mm. drive two on there. And like I just was Crazy. switching stuff out because it was inspiring. It was fun. Yeah. Um, so like the Kemper stage is going to give you killer tones and you'll have it all at your feet. It's one less thing like for your audio guy mm -hmm. to worry about. Like if you put your Kemper backstage trying to run an Ethernet cable back there could be a pain. Could be. Um, yeah, I've running, tried it and it's a pain. And then, and then you also have to run I your couldn't. I guitar. Had to bring, I had to bring the Kemper up on, on the on front. The yeah, me, yeah. Like depending on where you're at, like we even have like a pretty, like, legitimate routing system mm -hmm. at our main campus, and like even that would be hard for us. So like if you're trying to get off stage, then you have to run your quarter inch back to the Kemper. Mm -hmm. Like you can't plug into the remote. So like if you're gonna be, it, I mean, it almost seems null and void to me for them to do. The remote and the head anymore that remote and the Kemper separately like if you're gonna yeah. ever use it together because if you want to use it in an amp just put the thing just use it the same way but then you always have the remote with you too yeah so yeah so I think bottom line is to I mean to answer that question is do you like the workflow and the experience of playing your pedals into the stomp because I can guarantee you, you can get tone out of the stomp that sounds as good as the Kemper. Mm -hmm. Which is a bold statement to make, I know, but it's true. Which is kind of funny because the Especially Kemper... Especially if you use Tone Junkie IRs. The Kemper stay in, or Tone Junkie profiles. Yes. On the Kemper, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Kemper is, is awesome. What it can do is awesome. Its effects are not... I don't think they're at the level of Line 6. Uh... Well, they are, but you just don't... They are in different they ways. Sound, they sound... The ones they have in there sound as good. It's just... It's not as flexible. Yeah. But I'm thinking more of like using a Helix. The Stomp, the stomp it's not as flexible because you can't use as many. But you're, you're talking about with uh, pedals. Okay. So, um, yeah. So that's, that's uh, Kemper. The Kemper stage. Really cool. Let's mm -hmm. just kind of talk about these different products. 
because ultimately what it comes down to is what workflow works best for you and what sort of approach inspires you. Yeah. Because to these days you can get any of these things and the tone that ultimately you will get will be on par with yeah. any of the others. And like we're not like genuinely like it's not a cop out. We're not like trying to like not yeah. pick a side because we want to like not hurt feelings or whatever. Like we we have the ones that everybody's looking at on the market right now. We mm -hmm. have an Axe 8, we have an Axe 3, we have a Kemper we have a Kemper with the pedal board and or remote, right? We have a Helix. We have a Stomp. Like, HX I use uh, Brian and I, yeah, and the HX effects. Brian and I are always switching. I think I switch more than you do. You do. But, like, I just switch up because I'm like, this is what's inspiring me today. Or uh, you also do I'm trying based to do on stuff. what you're doing that day. Yeah. If I'm, like, if I got a lead guitar player that I know is going to cover leads, and I'll just use the Helix because I don't need to worry about it's just stuff. easier to hit one button. Yeah. Yeah. But basically, like, for real, seriously, when we sit down and compare everything, like, there's pluses to each one, and there's, I don't want to call them cons. They're I mean, just, they have strengths and weaknesses. They, that's yeah. the better way to put it. There are strengths and weaknesses, and there's stuff better for your application. Like, if you're a worship leader who occasionally plays electric guitar, then I'd say, like, a stomp with a couple pedals. If you're a worship leader who yeah. always plays electric and really not lead, I'd probably say just get you a Helix, because then... You got it, mm -hmm. like, all there. Um, if you're a guy who plays lead guitar, like, all the time, and you're always going to make presets, like, I, the Kemper, you could get by with the Kemper, and I say that because, or the Helix, I say that because the Axe Effects, that's, a, that's, that's pricey. So, like, if you're, it's like... two times as much as a Helix. It is. When you get the foot controller. Right it's, there. like, about three grand. So, like, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're a guy who's, like, playing a lot, and you want lots of options, and... You want to have really, really pristine, high quality sounds like the Axe Three. Like, there's so many there, reasons to choose effects, one or the other. Yeah, the Axe Three has the best effects of anything, yeah. in my opinion, hands down. And they do pitch really, really well, like mm -hmm. polyphonic pitch, which Helix can't do yet. But there yet. are talks of that being so, worked on. Yeah. Um, so I hope that that's helpful to people. It's, it may be helpful or it may not be helpful because the answer is it doesn't really matter what yeah. you use. It's just what, and it's hard to, it's also, we get to that it's hard to know what what sort of workflow or piece of hardware you're going to bond with without actually playing them all. And so, um, and the only reason we have all these things is because we build patches and presets and uh, performances. I think I covered all the bases there for all of them. So, um, and they're available at Worship Tutorials. So you can get from us or from other people, you can get, you know, pre-made sounds and just be ready to go right off the bat. And you can use that to like, because well, that's what I did, uh, is Nick Rice, when I played the Pod HD500X, I, my tone was terrible. And Nick Rice played one and he his tone was great. And I was like, Nick, show me how you build patches on this thing. And he did. And so I took his stuff and reverse engineered it, and that's how I learned. Boom. Yeah. Okay. And we have free <clears throat> stuff that you could grab. Yeah, free stuff. So that's, do lots of other people do too. That like, is. Junkie lots has of a lot people of free do. Stuff. Yeah. Grab free stuff and figure out what you like about it and all yeah. that jazz. Okay, so there was another question that I wanted to get to, and I don't remember who asked it, but they said, "Do you guys? What about amps? Oh yes. Was there? Is there? Do you ever have inspiration to play an amp in pedal board? And it like that's another segue into." Some more stuff we talked about at NAM, mm -hmm. and that we're probably going to be showing you here at Worship Tutorials. Um, I haven't played an amp in a long time, and I don't actually own an amp. And neither do I. But there are some really good solutions. So the problem, one of the things about amps that it makes it difficult for church players is no, is volume. That's really the big because part. to get them to sound right, to mm -hmm. get them to sound their best, you got to crank them. Um, and it was interesting, the guy, the, the guy who works at Boss, who developed the Boss, the Waza tube expander, which we're going to talk about, and work, used to work at Line 6 and like developed, basically did the all DL4. the programming for the DL4 delay and a lot of sounds. He was with MXR for a while. Too. Yeah, he, he's, the guy's a genius. Yeah. He was talking about, like, talking about this. He said, the problem with people who play amps and turn them to one because they're so loud is... Like, your tubes don't really work. And he was talking about the power tubes, and it's like if you have four tubes in your amp, 
It's like you don't really get that sweet tone until the fourth one. And the fourth one doesn't come on until it's pushed hard enough by the volume. Yeah, and so basically all that to say, um, you've got to push amps loud to get them their best. Which is, like for a lot of churches, is impossible because you're on a little stage. And if you played it that loud, it's the only thing you would hear. Even even if they're like off stage, it's still going to be, yeah. it still could be too much. So there's that. And then the, if you're playing an amp, you've got to mic it, right? You've got to put microphones on it. And you've got to put them in the same place every time. And you've got to run them into good preamps. And then you have to have a sound engineer who knows how to compress and EQ that. Mm-hmm. Because you have to do some work to it. Jeff Singliff, thank you, Mark. That's who that was. The guy was awesome. Jeff Slingluff, S-L-I-N-G-L-U-F-F. Um, so there are some products on the market that that can help you, and there are actually a lot of amps are coming out that have like digital outs, basically. Yeah. Um, but so what? The, what? So there's a couple products. The UA Ox Box is probably one of the more popular ones, and what that does is you can have you have so if you take the output of your amp and run it into something besides a speaker, you have to have a load box there or you will ruin your amp. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's what a speaker does. It receives that load from the from the head. So there's a thing called a load box, and that's what the aux, you know a lot of a lot of these products have it all built in. So you take the output of your amp and not instead of going to the speaker or the cabinet, you run it into one of these boxes and it receives the load of the amp and then it um, either digitally emulates a uh, speaker cabinet output or it runs... With a microphone set up. The Oxbox, you can go like on their program on the desktop and like create a whole rig. It's crazy. It's cool. Or you can use IRs, which are recreations of a mic'd speaker cabinet. Um, and so there's the Oxbox, but but Boss is putting out a new one called the Waza, W-A-Z-A, which is like their really high-end uh, product line. And they're redoing stuff so like classic vibrato, chorus, yeah. Dimension C, Blues Driver. They even put out a Waza, cr- it's called Waza Craft, I think is yeah. what they call it, mm-hmm. a tuner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's pretty funny to me. I need to read more about <laughs> that. I keep meaning to them, like, what's the difference here? Yeah, so the Waza Tube Amp Expander is the boss's new product, and uh, I think we're going to get one to try out. We just need to get an amp, which we've got some leads on that, too. So the question, Let us know what kind of amp you'd like to see at Worship yeah, Tutorials. Yeah, because I, honestly, I feel like we people don't talk about amps as much, at least in some of these gear talk groups we're in. Yeah. Like, everybody's using Helix, and that's, like, the thing. Yeah. Um... But, like, to answer the question, like, I chose to go get a Kemper because yeah. I wanted an amp but didn't want to lug it around. Yeah. And, like, I didn't, I wanted to be able to record at home and to play at home without having to bring my amp home from church because the amp, like, I didn't want to be driving on the back roads I drove on with tubes because it was. I always heard things shaking and stuff. Well, it's kind of funny, but it's uh, legit. It's that Man. that was it, and I was just like, <laughs> I just. It's part of owning a tube amp. I, for a guy who loves gear as much as I do, mm-hmm. I have never really cared too too much about amps. That's true, because you used a. I used a Blues Junior for a long time, and I loved it. Well, I would say you did care about it. You, that was just your sound. That, I loved it. I loved. You it. had a yeah. special edition Humboldt version. Yeah, which the was speaker really cool. was awesome. It was like a hemp cone speaker, so it was a lot softer. I heard it next to a like a standard run of the mill Blues Junior. It's different, and like mine sounded like way different, it's different. way better. Yeah. Um, but, but the like, other thing to me, I'm sorry to cut you off. The other thing to me is you bought a matchless lightning. I did, and you. T- I- and you send it. You sold it. I've been told that the lightning is not a good is not a good foray into, into is that the matchless. word foray yeah. into matchless because they are mega bright. They're notorious for that. Yeah. Um. I have played like like um an HC thirty, and I was like, holy crap. Yeah. No, like that's, a, that's yeah. That's a beast of an amp. Um. I had a Vox AC fifteen for like a couple months, and I was like super into that too. Like it's just it's yeah. straightforward. Um. But that's why I went with Kemper, um, and there was like really no resources at the time. The only guys who used it were like Michael Britt and then like metal guys. Like yeah. like like this is barely two years ago, like two and a half years ago. Yeah, is when this was the case. Um, the community that we formed over at Kemper P and W is is one thing that's changed things. And um, yeah, 
it, I would go back to an amp, I guess, but it's just like, it. I don't have any ill will towards amps. It's just, yeah. I found what works for me. Um, but I'd like to, I want one because I want to, Brian and I, I at least said this, said this to Brian before, I'm like, if we don't have a tube amp, we're going to forget what good tone sounds like. I don't think so. Like, we're going to get so, so far removed from analog, (laughs) like, real tubes and all. You do make a point. That we're going to just be... important to have the reference. Yeah, Yeah. because our reference is going to be the last Helix patch we made, (laughs) or the last profile we use on a Kemper. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's there's potential for an AC30 showing up. We'll see. Something like that. Yeah, so... um, so I think we're going to be able to get a Waza tube amp expander Your. from Boss to demo. And I'm actually really excited because I have I have pedals laying around. I need a what well, you know what I need is a uh, well I have HX effects that I can use for for that. But like it'd be fun to build a, a, a analog board again, but then what would I do with it? I don't have Use it for videos. So what I <laughs> what I would need is a good compressor. Which you have like four. Maybe you can loan me one. I have two. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you have two boards, so you need them both. I need a good compressor, and I need a good delay. And uh, I have HX effects, which is like nine great delays, really, if you think and about like that And like five one. great compressors. Because I have, yeah, so I'd probably use HX effects with some drives. That would be my board. Um, and I would run the drives in a effects loop. I don't know why I'm going down this road. I'd run the drives in an effects loop because I would run the compressor on HX effects first. Yep. And then I'd run the drives in the effects loop so that I could place the drives inside of the chain inside of HX effects. And then I would run reverb and delay from HX effects. Or I'd run that Boss RV6 uh, over there for delay or for verb, for like ambient verb. And I'd probably have an always on like hall in the, or, or actually I like the plate verb. From mm-hmm. line six, the met the most for like a subtle verb, and um, yeah, and I'd run analog drives because I've got the Will Sledge stuff that sounds awesome, and yeah, that would be my my analog rig. And I'd run it into I don't know what amp, Tone King Imperial. That'd be awesome. That's the amp. We'll figure that out. <laughs> or a Benson, uh, what's the Benson Vox style amp? Uh, the Monarch. The Monarch. Yeah. Uh, okay, so or the ear heart. Sean at home says HX effects gets no love, which is true, um, but it is killer. Like for if you're running a board and you just need stuff, it's awesome. Yeah, because their effects modeling is is great. Okay, what you got? Do you see any questions there that you think we it, could answer? It was a PGS Humboldt. Yes, I saw that. It That's um, exactly what it they is. They did like three runs there. They did. A forest green one. I had that and sold it stupidly, so I bought the wine red one, and then I sold that recently. Then they did like a black one, which is when Fender kind of I had took the black over. One. That's right, and Fender kind of took over the speaker, so it was like a yours proprietary was, speaker. Yours at that was point. better than mine. Yeah, it sounded different. Version two was better than version three that I had. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeff Lancaster asks, "What is different in the stomp and the floor? Helix stomp and Helix floor? Oh, Helix stomp is like just a tiny." Helix floor is the big, the big one, the big daddy, and you can run the OG thirty like some different effects blocks or amps or whatever. And Helix HX Stomp is uh, a tiny little version, which I have right here. This is Stomp, um, and you can only run six blocks in this. So there's like so, so many different ways people use it. It's not even funny. It's like a fourth of a of a real Helix, but the sounds are exactly the same. Yeah, everything's available to you. You just can't you can't yeah. do as much at one time. Yeah. I, I saw a board the other day on Instagram. Somebody had two... Two stomps? Two stomps. See, I don't... Why would you have two stomps? I would have a stomps and an HX effects, personally. Yeah. Because you can run a lot more blocks in HX effects. Okay. Um, <laughs> what would you choose to buy? Kemper, Helix, or Fractal? You can choose just one. Dario 21. Well, we have... You, we, must, you must not have been at we the beginning of this that conversation. Mis- but that's, that's a great question. What would you buy if you could buy just one, Brad? I think I know you'd buy a Kemper. I don't know. You're like I think you're I think Kemper is your thing with the board. Yeah. I would probably buy Helix. It depends on how much money you have to spend. Yeah. I mean if you are on a budget and it depends the Helix on how you play is the way to depends on how you like running gear. Yeah. There's so many questions. I don't know. Hey Ron, uh but Axe FX three Ron. is pretty awesome. I mean if you have the budget, it's pretty great. Um yeah, but Helix will get you there too. All right. 
Um, yeah, do we have any other questions? It's probably about time for us to go. we got to get some cheese. We have a little time. This. Okay. Ricardo, this is... that, bro, literally, up to you. Are you tired of lugging your amp? Then get a stomp. <laughs> yeah. Or like, if you, if you need, like, if you're ever wondering, wanting, like, a couple different pedals that you just don't have, like, that one song you're doing that needs chorus, or, like, yeah. and you're just, like, I wouldn't mind not carrying an amp anymore, get a stomp. Like, it's it's up to you. Like you can get great sounds, you can get great sounds out of the stomp, and you can get terrible sounds out of the stomp. You can get great sounds out of your, this is true. your fender, but you can also get terrible sounds out of your fender. Yes, if it's not mic'd up true. right, or if you run a hundred foot cable from your pedal board to the back of the wherever your church is, and you have to run a hundred foot cable in order to get it off the stage, like yeah. So it depends on a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, the, but the Fender uh, HRD, what does HRD stand for? Hot Rod Deluxe? I think so, yeah. Uh, the, that, those Fender Hot Rods are great amps. Like, that would be a cool amp to use with the Waza Tube Expander. I actually, well, you Is can that get not the some of the... That, that Coldplay uses? The guy from Coldplay? DeVille's, I think. Oh, that's a DeVille. But, or he may use different stuff all the time. Yeah. But, like, a Hot Rod, you, you get, like, a Deluxe, you, you can find them for, like, three or four hundred dollars. They're great and amps. And they're awesome amps. I actually thought about that recently. I was like, maybe I should get one of those. Yeah, this is probably, if you're into amps, this is probably like, probably the best time ever to be in the yeah. amp, amp buying market because, you know, with, with modeling and profiling and stuff as good as it is and so many people uh, switching over to it, I think there's a lot of people who um, who are unloading amps and if you know economics, supply and demand. There are a lot of people trying to get rid of and Kempers the supply too. is real high and the demand is real low, the price goes whoop yep. down. Yes, a lot of people are trying to get rid of Kempers. Kempers, yeah, to this get is the a good stage. time to buy a Kemper. And like people yeah. are, so there's a we have a Kemper group. Can we talk about this? Because I'd is, like to yes, talk. This about is it. funny. Okay, it's not a. I'm not like trying to be offensive. I'm just saying from the, on this side of the fence. I'd like to be offensive. Okay, well, on this side of the fence, what we're seeing <laughs> is Kemper drops a new product, and which is awesome. It's it's uh right? it is awesome. the, the head and the and the remote it's basically a great, it's basically a great product. they took the head the remote yeah. and put it together. First off, people are like, why no expression pedal? Because a lot of these hardcore rockers that typically use a Kemper don't have they don't do volume spells, boys. It's okay. You can... the other the other thing is like <laughs> if you look at Helix, like look see if you can find out what goes wrong with people's Helix. Yeah, it's... Helices. It's always the expression yeah, pedal. Always the expression pedal. And it's so probably, it's, you're probably better off. And actually. so it's probably the weakest point as far or the highest failure Cause point. Because it actually, because you're rocking on it. Yeah. And using it all the time. Anyway, um, continue. So people are, 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 mind you, we said this earlier. Oh, I'm so ready. The Kemper is seven years old. Yes. And Kemper decided to release something new. And people are getting, I've seen people getting bent out of shape. Yes. Because they're like, oh my gosh, my Kemper is going to be devalued now. Yes, and the second you bought that 2019 Toyota whatever and you drove it off the lot, it lost like a third of its value or something. Yes. It's just, it's just how it goes. Any company that's ever released product A and then came and released the update to product A, the initial product always loses value because that's just, that is just the market, <laughs> that is just the way things are. Unless you are Bill Finnegan and you created Klons where his... KTRs are going down in price and the old clons are going up. Yeah. We are approaching almost 2K or more for original clon now. It was like 1200 like four years ago. The hype surrounding this product is not of my making. Or what does he write yeah, on the KTR? Uh, please understand that, yeah, yes. something like that. Yeah. But um, so the Kemper stage, people are, are kind of, they're trying I'm to so sell ready. their Kemper so and their remote. They're trying to sell it. And I'll let Brian go from here. Okay. <laughs> I okay, so did I'm you excited. Study business in school? I did. I have an MBA. So you have an MBA business. and chemistry and biology. Yes, I went to graduate school at night and got an MBA, which is a master's in business administration. I barely have my from, undergrad from barely. Oklahoma City University. Yes, which is why I understand how supply and demand works. That's that's just basic economics. I think most people understand that. Um, so here's the thing. Kemper releases the, the stage, the product, right? Which I think is awesome. It's so cool. I think they missed an opportunity to be able to let it run dual profiles, but maybe Kemper's going to release Kemper 2 
soon. Uh, who knows? Who knows? I mean... Because they kept the stage under wraps. Most other companies would have... Re- the, here's the point. Most other companies would have released two, two, uh, two iterations of... Two generations of products in seven years. Yeah. That's Helo- not, that's Line not 6, Fractal, all of them. Okay? Apple... <laughs> so here's here's the thing. It's like they, every year they update. They stuff. release Kemper Stage, or they talk about it. Which the way they released it was awesome. Props to them because nobody knew a thing, and then all of a sudden it was like, boom, you can buy one. Yeah. Okay. Fractal. Within a week, it was announced. It was Take teased, yes. announced, and they're available out. in stores. Yeah, that's all they're gonna make. That's good for them. My MBA education tells me they did good. Okay. <laughs> so. um <clears throat> So here's the thing. I'm hanging out in the Kemper Praise and Worship Forum on Facebook, which I love. I think it's a great community. Uh, of all like the gear specific communities for praise and worship, I'll, Kemper Praise and Worship is at the top of the heap. It's just really cool. So um, I saw people saying it better not have all the functionality that my Kemper head does. Like I saw people saying that. Like if they put it out and it does more than my head, I'm going to be mad. Somebody, I saw people say that. So what you're saying is a company releases a product. Seven years later, they release an update to the product. And because you don't want the value of your seven-year-old piece of hardware to go down, you hope that they cripple it? Like, so you basically hope Kemper fails? You would like Kemper to go out of business? That, that's what you're saying. Okay, first of all. Second of all, I see people saying like, my the value of my Kemper head is going to go down by two extra hundred dollars. Okay, so it's like you buy a piece of hardware that's seven years old, whether you bought it last week or not. It's the the tech is seven years old, and they put out an update for it, and you expect to be able to sell your seven year old piece of hardware that is now updated for like two hundred dollars less than new, and you're upset that you can't like. But, you know what? You know one way to define leadership, Bradford? This is what John Maxwell says. Leaders define, define reality. reality. I'm going to define reality for you. I have a Kemper head. If I wanted to sell it right now, I might be able to get $1,200 for it. And I'd be happy. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe less. I have a head and remote, and I think 1500 for both of them would probably be the, where, where it would land. Probably the high end, too. And if you don't like that, then... I mean, we could be that wrong. <laughs> we could be we could be wrong, but go ahead and sell yours and put the go ahead and put the head and the remote up for two grand and let us know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, it'll sit. I'm gonna tell you right now. Uh, I don't know why I'm so fired up about it. It's just I just I see that and I'm just like, come on, you don't want a company to like innovate and make new stuff. Like I, what I hope is that Kemper at Winter Nam next year or this year makes Kemper too. I hope they do, and that it runs two profiles, and that the profiling is better, so that it sounds better, and the effects are better, and you get more options for them. Like that would be great. The Kemp, that would be awesome. Did you did you buy your uh, XT five hundred new when you got that seven yeah. years ago? How mm-hmm. much was it then? The Pod HD five hundred X five hundred dollars. Okay, okay, so a little different. The the higher you go up in price, the bigger yeah. the drop off is. I think. Right. So like Kempers are like eighteen hundred new. So like I uh, it would not be uncommon because you can get one combined for seventeen or eighteen because you can get the stage for like seventeen or eighteen now. Mm-hmm. Like I thought it was seventeen, right? I think it it may be. I don't know, but like expecting to get fifteen hundred out of your Kemper when there are eighteen hundred new would totally be viable up to two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Totally legitimate. Right, right. Because like $300 off, like that's a big, especially if it's in good condition. Mm-hmm. But like now, like because of the higher the price is and because you could get something that does the exact same thing, but with a controller. Yeah. Like some people, like people are 100% saying, people are saying they 100% don't need one. They're like, I do studio work. I like having my Kemper on my, on my, uh, mm-hmm. on my desk. I have a remote on the floor. Like that's the perfect solution for me. Um, I'm totally good. But there are people like you're gonna have to be willing to sell your Kemper for like a thousand bucks or eleven hundred bucks if you want it to move. Mm. Yeah, but it's I mean, it's just the reality of owning old hardware. Well, how much is a how much is a Helix? Helix rack sixteen hundred. Helix rack a Helix with a foot controller. Let's find it out. Helix rack. But see, I don't. 
Yeah, with a foot controller. So the Helix rack is fourteen hundred, and the controller is four hundred. So you're looking at eighteen hundred for the rack and the controller. And the uh, if you get a if you get a floor, it's sixteen. And if you get a floor, it's sixteen hundred. Yeah. It's and there's perspective. And there's not. I don't think there's any. There might be a little bit difference in like input and output on the rack versus the floor. Um, I think it's interesting that that Kemper priced their uh, stage unit right about where Helix is. I think that's a hundred dollars more, right? Yeah. He he. So I thought it was going to be like eighteen, nineteen, yeah, two thousand. I thought it would be nineteen ninety nine or seventeen yeah. ninety nine, but. We have some super chats that I want to thank you guys. Brad Miller, uh, he's tired of lugging his amps around, so he got a stomp. He, and then he says, enjoy lunch. Brad, you sound like a wise... You, I, you sound like a person I'd like to be friends with. Yeah. I like to surround myself with people who are wise. And people named Brad. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dan Stanley, what kind of guitar neck do you prefer? Dan Stanley, what kind of... Yeah, what kind of guitar neck do you prefer, Brad? Thank you for your super chat, Dan. Are you talking about uh, like the way the neck, like the pro, this neck right here, this is one, magic right here, <laughs> on this Elliot? <laughs> That's an Elliot Tone Master. Tone Master. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. What is this? Like a medium C? Yeah, I'd say so. I like necks that are a little wider. So when you're looking at when you're looking at a guitar, you you can look at the nut width, and I I don't know off the top of my head what common nut widths are but like some are a little wider than others and I like a wider fretboard uh, some people don't like that because um, yeah for whatever it's just how usually it's the kind of guitar you grew up on playing you, you tend to like uh, I don't like super super big necks but I also don't like really thin necks that PRS is a um, they're wide thin which actually isn't that thin it's pretty it's pretty much like a regular medium C shape and, uh, but I like it because it's a little wider. Another thing I like about necks is, and this is a great example, a lot of high-end guitars, they'll roll the edge of the fretboard. Mm. So the, so like right here where you're, basically where your thumb, your hand it feels goes like across. like a piece of wood. Yeah, it's, um, it's like smooth and kind of rounded over. That's really nice. That's a nod to vintage guitars because people who play a guitar for 50 years just wear it, you know, by playing it. Um, and then the 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 dressing of the frets. This this guitar is, is legit perfect. This is a perfect electric guitar. Um, the it, the fretwork is just immaculate. But yeah, so that's the kind of guitar neck I prefer. Uh, the Jennings back here has a roasted maple neck. So the other thing to talk about with necks is what kind of material do you like? Most a lot of electric guitar necks, the back will either be maple or uh, like a mahogany. Yeah. So the PRS, I think, is a mahogany, I think. But then the, oh, is it? the fretboard material will be various things. Maple. Uh, a lot of fenders Ebony. use maple. Like if it's light colored, it's typically maple. And maple has a finish on top of it. So uh, it has like a glossy finish or maybe a satin finish, but it's got a lacquer of some kind. Rosewood uh, is, a, uh, is what this is. And a lot of times rosewood, well, rosewood doesn't have a finish, so it's natural wood. Um, which I like the feel of more. Yeah, me too. Personally. And I like the look of more, personally. Yeah. Ebony is another uh, wood that is, is used. Is ebony? Yeah. So that, that Martin has an ebony uh, fingerboard. Seven. Ebony fingerboard, which is going to be for sale very, very soon. Ooh. If you want it, let me know. Um, and the ebony is like a darker, more dense kind of a wood. It it's feels a lot, smoother. It's smoother than like rosewood. And uh, also unfinished. And it, I love the way it feels. And you'll find them on some electric guitars as well. Um, but most of the time electric guitars will either go rosewood or maple. Or roasted maple. maple. Roasted Which maples. I have two guitars that are like that. My yeah. Sir Telly and then my um, Jennings Custom Navigator. It's got cremas mm -hmm. and a Bigs B on it. Mr. Chad Jennings does awesome yeah. words and maple necks. And I actually have a Strat that's being built mm -hmm. with the guys at 920D. Roasted maple is, is really is really cool. It's like a um, it feel to me it feels sort of in between. It like, does. It depends on the finish it. of it. If you get like I a satin it. finish, but like the way Jennings does it is 
Mm, Chad good. Jennings is a wizard. But the thing about roasted maple that's really nice is um, because it's roasted, uh, basically, essentially it's baked, it hardens all the resins inside the wood. It's got some extra It changes snap. the way it sounds, mm-hmm. which some people might say that that makes a difference. Some people say it makes less of a difference. Uh, but what, what it, it makes a difference, it makes a difference, but what it really does is it makes the neck stronger. And so it's very much more, it's less susceptible to changes in temperature and humidity. So, um, it needs less maintenance, which is really nice, especially if you travel a lot, like if you tour or something, you go from one climate to the next, a roasted maple neck is way more stable than a non-roasted maple neck. Mm-hmm. So that's something to know. Mm-hmm. And so it's typically a little more expensive, but I think it's worth it. Um, Rick Brand, what's up, buddy? He's late to the party. What did he miss? I kind of went off on the Kemper thing about people being upset about the fact that the stage. So, Rick, here's the thing. We went off about how um, <laughs> the people were upset that the stage didn't have less functionality, that it had as much functionality as the the head or the rack unit. And uh, also, we're upset. Are upset about the fact that their uh, Kemper head or rack is now worth a little bit less than it used to be. And I, I was talking about how foolish that is because it's a seven-year-old product. Okay, so companies put out new stuff, and the old stuff doesn't isn't worth as much anymore. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Somebody asked about Gretsch's, and we oh, like that's this my one. favorite one. Yes, um, I've also played a Black Falcon that I adored. I'm not really into the vibe of the White Falcon. The white and gold is a little too gaudy yeah. for me. I don't think anybody who has one looks that way, but I feel like when I use it, I look like, I feel I feel weird. I think that looks sweet, but it's just not for me. Leslie, thank you for the super chat. Uh, I don't see a question or anything in there, but if you have one, let us know. We'd be happy to answer it. One, uh, so, <laughs> um, Sean at home said, you miss Brian denouncing the Helix in the entire community of Helix. <laughs> So that here's the thing, we didn't true. really talk about Helix that much yet. Well, we have, but um, Helix put out firmware version 2.80, and the the uh, com- the computer technically savvy people among us will tell us over and over that it's 2.80, not 2.8, which makes a difference, okay? That guitar is probably not in tune every time you pick it up like the McPherson is. Because it's, it's not made out of carbon fiber, it's made out of wood, wood moves. All right. So, um, I, I'm going to, moment of truth here. I have been playing for the past four or five months or so, the Axe FX3 live every weekend. I've been playing it with the FC12 foot controller. And, um, so I've been, and, and with the 2.80 firmware that came out, we built some new patches Yes. Use some of their new, uh, use the new like drives. Actually, the King of Tone is what everyone was talking about. The the Zen drive or the Dyna drive is equally as good in my it's opinion. It's killer. It's like it's kind of has a almost like a tube screamer type of a thing. Like it does that mid range push thing. It's not it's as just, extreme. Right. It sounds so good. And the two of them together, the King of Tone or the Air or the Prince of Tone model and the Dyna or the Zen drive, in with each other is. It's my new favorite combo of drives in the Helix. So, um, yeah, so I've been, so we built these patches, and then I'm going through all my old song patches that are for sale on the site that I used to use live, and I'm updating them with, like, the new, the new Ant models and things, and the new Fullerton, and I, I can't tell the difference now between Axe Effects 3 and, and Helix. I don't know what happened, because a week ago I could. I mean, I'll just be honest, oh, before 2.80 came out with the the way I had, we had our pet maybe it was the way I don't know but like Axe FX3 in a head to head always would sound better to me so that's what I that's what I used live but um I missed Helix because it's so much easier to use and set up yeah for me and and it really so Axe FX3 has a great editor and like for Dave yeah and Austin. for Dave yeah the guys at church Axe FX or Fractal has a great editor that's very easy to use and way more flexible in what you can do with signal routing. So you can't do things with signal routing in Helix that you can with Fractal, just the way they built it. But um, where it really, the rubber hits the road is if uh, Dave says to me, hey Brian, that sound is a little bright on that setting. Can you dip 2K a little bit for me, right? 
both fractal and helix will do that but on helix all you got to do is push a touch the thing knob you're done on fractal you got to put your guitar go down you got to go backstage or wherever your Axe FX3 is you got to go into all the menus that are like on the screen it's it's not hard to edit but it's way more it's way more complicated more involved yeah yeah so you can do the same thing with helix it's done like that with with Axe FX3 it's a little more involved so it's way easier for me to use it um, and so I'm using Helix this weekend for the first time on live in months. Meanwhile, I've been using it almost every week. I know you yeah. have. And I can't tell you how excited I am. <laughs> and so, um, I feel like I'm reborn. Like a phoenix rising... Uh, that's from Seinfeld. Rising from the ashes. <laughs> that's when Frank Costanza um, decides to start cooking again. Uh, <laughs> I feel reborn. Like a phoenix <laughs> rising from the ashes. Okay. Uh, Glorious ruins. What? And so, yeah, I mean... I, I don't know what they did, what Line 6 did, but it, it legit sounds... They sound different because they're diff. I mean, even if they're the same amp model, like they model different ver different copies. You know, they like the amp that... The AC30 that Fractal has is different than the AC30 that Line 6 has. And so those two real amps sound different. So, like, their models are going to sound a little different. Yeah. But um, I couldn't tell you one sounds better than the other at this point. Which is crazy, because Axe FX3 is twice the price. But again, you can, nice. you, can do, you can do stuff with it that you can't with Helix. But for me, what I want on a Sunday morning, playing lead guitar is what I'm playing mostly these days. Um, I'm, I'm, Meanwhile, I play like zero. I'm excited to be. Yeah, it's just kind of funny, because Brad is a way better lead player than me. Um, anyway, that was a long, random rant. Rick Brand calls me the prodigal son. I'm an equal opportunity guy. Oh, you know? Both of us are. <laughs> like seriously, like I don't at this point I, I mean, I, I hope this doesn't come across as like, la dee da, look at me. But like no, because I, I have a helix and a Kemper and I have a remote and I have a pedal board, like there is no which one do you prefer. It's just like, well what am I what are you having me play today? Am yeah. I playing all lead? That'll change things. What song are am I playing lead for? Like, what do yeah. I need? Like, it's just what tool fits the job best. Yeah. So. Um, here's an interesting question, then we're going to leave, because we got to go. Philip Judah says, any, I did not know this. Um, I didn't know this. And Leslie, thank you again. Um, second super chat from Leslie. Appreciate that. Um, Philip says, any thoughts on David Hislop from Bethel getting a pair of Kempers? I did not know that. Is that for real? I don't know. Let's let's assume he did. I bet I know why. I bet I know why it's happened now and it's, not earlier. It's this thing <laughs> that all these P and W guys are using modelers to make their own sounds and sell their packs. So I mean, I I don't blame the dude. Like people probably want sounds from him, and yeah. they can get it. But at the same time, well, I was I mean, thinking of the Kempers are awesome. I was, yeah, they are. I was thinking something else because well, um, Bethel has like notoriously been anti digital at least right? yeah at least some of the and i guys. and it's like there's all these stories about how like if you try out for bethel like if you have a digital amp solution like you don't even get your foot through the door i who knows how true that is uh but also bethel's main lead guitar player was is used to be um what's his name michael pope. michael pope who i met at nam and was like the nicest guy yeah we sat, it was funny, I met him, and he was like, he was super, like, laid back, really nice, um, and we found out that we were both from Oklahoma, and so I started talking to him about being from Oklahoma, and then I thought, like, I'm some random dude that he has no idea, like, I, like and he's probably got somewhere to go, <laughs> so finally I was like, it was nice to meet you, and then I let him go. So All right, see ya. I need to be self-aware enough to know that, like, he's probably, I don't want to annoy him. Anyway. Super nice guy, but he is pretty famously like doesn't like modelers, and he used to be their lead guitar player. Yeah, uh, he's in Nashville now. Yeah, stuff. so he moved to. He's not That's with why Bethel we saw anymore. Him there. So my guess is that Bethel is now using Kempers. I think maybe maybe Michael Pope leaving might have opened the door, but who, that's speculation. Who knows? I'm not saying anything positive or negative about anybody. I'd like that to be out there. Um, like I said, he was like the nicest guy. It was cool to be able to meet him. Hey, speaking of people we met, and we'll finish here. Yeah. We, at Nam, Wednesday night we get into town, and there's a there's a meetup, and Stu G's there, 
And Brian oh, and I boy. meet Stu G, and it was great. And we were like, all right, man, see ya. And then didn't realize he was going to be spending the next three we days We hung with out us. with Stu G for like the whole time. He texted us on Sunday morning after we had been home just to reiterate yeah. that he enjoyed us. So we are lovely people, according to Stu G. <laughs> He's so, this is the connection we This had. is me holding my phone and me pointing at my phone. That's yes. what that was. Well, you have your phone there. You yeah, <laughs> could have used the actual prop. Um, so... Stu G works with Jonathan Sullivan or HW, sorry, HW, at Tone Junkie. Like they do, uh, they put together Kemper packs. Stu uses Kemper live now. Um, and, and Tone Junkie profiled his amps, and so he uses them when he tours. Yeah, they have a. They with have a Michael W. Smith. Them. No big deal. NBD. Yeah, um, and so anyway, we know we know HW, we know the Tone Junkie guys, and so it was kind of like that's how we kind of connected. But it was awesome. We got to hang out. The highlight of the trip, I think, for me, two both of them involving Stu G. One of them, both of them involving him playing awesome stuff. Yeah. One of them was sitting in a little room, Stu G playing uh, an Elliott guitar, Elliott through an Elliott amp. Yeah, the Elliott. He was At playing like, their just, telly. Yeah. Through the Drew, Drew Shirley signature amp, and he was playing like delirious riffs. Just like full volume. It was awesome. And then the second highlight was at Carter Vintage, Stu G again, in a tiny little room, packed with like four or five guys, uh, playing a 1960 Les Paul. Well, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. It was, no one was really sure. The tag was really weird. <laughs> it had it was all still kinds $15, of $15,000. It wasn't original. It was a $15,000 1960 Les Paul through a uh, park P75, which Stu came up to me. He's like, "That's the park that's in the Helix." I didn't know that. That's the amp model in the Helix. We need to make uh-huh. a patch on that. Okay. Um, through a park P75 again at just like full volume, just assault on your ears. Yeah. Sounded so good though. Yeah. Anyway, that was a lot of fun. We met Lincoln Brewster briefly. Met James Duke briefly. <laughs> Yeah, I got to I meet t- Joel Cordy, who created the Gravitas. Ooh. I got so excited to meet that dude. Stu was so excited to meet you because, and he even told me because I went and shook his hand. He's like, "This, this is Bradford. He's the guy who made the Kilt in the Wild Instagram account." Like, yeah, he was just, there like, was a time where I really so wanted to run an Instagram account that everybody followed <laughs> and it didn't go very well. Because he the, was just so happy. The Kilt is is Stu's, uh, is Stu G's uh, signature drive pedal from JHS. Um, yeah, I, t- when I met, I met Lincoln Brewster and I told him about how somebody had taken his X3 live patch. And oh yeah. Profiled it on the Kemper and like, it sounds so good. He had no idea. He thought that was pretty funny. It is pretty funny. He's like, I've, sh- I've actually thought about doing that. <laughs> That's what he told me. I think those were great highlights, but we had a killer time hanging out with Jonathan Sullivan yeah. and Curtis Lamberton. Uh, and getting to meet yes. them and Doug Doppler in person. Yeah. Um, some good friends. And somebody said that we were name dropping. Hey, we're just telling you our experience. You go to Nam, you can meet we cool need the, people we need too. We need a little horn. We need a horn like, yeah. like, like, a, like a, that pedal show. But, yeah, I mean, we just had a grand old time. Um, I mean, yeah, we're it's not and, like we're like hanging out. Not like we're texting these, like, you know, yeah, like no. a Pope or... or uh, Lincoln Brewster back and forth. No, we just like, hi, uh, I'm a, a huge fan of your work. Nice to meet you. Cool. Bye. Can I take a picture? Bye. That was See pretty you. much it. That's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> Except for Stu G. Yeah, we got we did get to hang out with Stu G, but only because you know we had that connection to yeah. through yeah. Tone Junkie. Um. Yeah. And you got anything else, Bradford? This has been Worship Tutorials Live with Brian and Bradford. That's all I got. Yeah. We uh, there was some cool stuff. But like somebody, I think people have asked like like what was the highlight or like the standout piece of gear. gear. Well, at I can NAMM. tell you for me. And I was like, you know what? Like, there's cool stuff, but nothing that I was like, holy crap. The uh, the Swindler effects, Red Mountain trim, and the Golf. Is that that white pedal board? Yeah. Playing? And then the Golf. It's called the Golf something or another. It's their chorus and it's stereo. Those were mega cool. And then the Red Panda Lab Tensor was mega cool. Yeah. I have to sneeze. <laughs> oh, didn't want to sneeze on that McPherson. I, I vampire sneezed. So you just sneeze on all of my electric guitars. No, I sneeze in my arm here. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, the high, one of the highlights as far as just gear goes, I was I spent a lot of time at the Eastman, Eastman. booth. Because yeah. I'm a fan of Eastman guitars, and I know that they put out 
They so Eastman, if you're not aware, they build guitars in China, but they have their They're own from factory. the East, man. <laughs> they have their own factory in China that's been in you know it's been Eastman only for generations, right? And they used to build, they still do build violins and things like that. But so they have uh, guitars that are shipped from overseas. They're all handmade. They're not like CNC, like you know, like uh, most guitars built overseas, built in the East, far East. But, um, and so a lot of them are pretty affordable. Like you can get a, a Gibson 335 style, their lower end one for, I bought one used for like $400 not that long ago, a few years ago. Anyway, but they have, um, Eastman has slowly sort of brought in higher and higher end models, still made overseas. So they're, they're cheaper, but basically what you get is like premium custom shop level guitar for like. $1,500, which is not cheap, but it's also not $4,000 or $3,000. It's kind of the same as what you get from uh, Jennings, you know? And so I really wanted to play some some of the new Eastman stuff. Like, they have single cuts, like Les Paul style. They are so good. So, um, probably my favorite gear that I played at NAMM was the Eastman guitar stuff. Yeah. I didn't play that much gear, though. I was just... We were just having too much fun just being there. Right. Having a lot of fun, hanging out with friends, running. I was taking a lot of video, so. We did get the, to see the new Line 6 Power Cap 212. Ooh, the Power Cap 212. Yeah. That thing looks pretty cool. Stereo Power Cap. Pretty awesome. This is All the, right. it's lunchtime music. Yeah, Tim says, stop playing. Can't hear me talk. Well, that's fine. Sorry about that. But it is lunchtime music, so we're gonna go eat some burgers. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>